Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's presentation, Making Apache Kafka Dead Easy with Stream Sets, brought to you by Stream Sets. I'd like to introduce you to our presenters. Clark Patterson is Head of Product Marketing at Stream Sets, responsible for product messaging, market intelligence, and evangelism. He brings over 20 years of big data and data management experience to Stream Sets and previously held similar positions at Confluent, Cloudera, and Informatica. Uh, we also have Kirit Basu, who heads up product management at StreamSets, responsible for product vision, strategy, and product market evaluation. He brings over 20 years of industry experience to StreamSets and previously spent time in healthcare, ed tech, and other entrepreneurial ventures. Uh, well, without further ado, uh, I'm going to turn things over to Clark to begin the presentation. All right. Thanks, Ryan. And thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. We're really happy to uh, have you all join us. Um, one question that I will get out of the way as we get started here is um, we generally get asked by people if the slides will be shared, and we are happy to do that. So um, some point after the uh, session today, we'll make sure that everyone gets the materials that we're going through. Um, so let's just kind of a quick review of the agenda here. Um, so we want to talk about uh, Kafka generally um, and just kind of review more for level setting. Um, just want to make sure that everybody's up to speed on what this is. Um, talk about, you know, what, what it is, where do you use it? And then more specifically, as, as a segue into the bulk of our presentation, talk about some of the challenges uh, that we see. So, um, you know, here at StreamSets, we do a lot of work with, with Kafka adopters. Um, I personally have had a unique experience to see um, Kafka adoption firsthand uh, at Confluent. Um, and there's some interesting uh, trends that, that emerge um, that we want to kind of break down today. And, um, and so we'll highlight those and then, of course, uh, segue that into, okay, what do you do about them and how do you actually stall, solve those things? Um, so stream sets, as, as we'll talk about, is, uh, is what we see as a, not the, but a, at least an ideal solution that can help you simplify a lot of this. So we're going to talk about stream sets control hub. Um, and, uh, and what it, it, it is and what it's capable of. And Kirit's going to walk us through a demo specifically of, of, of Kafka pipelines um, and how they look, how they can be built very, very easy with no code, um, and uh, give a good example of how customers are using us today to literally build Kafka pipelines in a matter of minutes in a lot of cases. Um, so um, a big advantage is there, and I think you'll uh, be pleased with what you see in the product. Um, when Kirit is done, we'll, we'll come back and I'll chat a little bit more about, you know, what are the implications of all this? What, what are some of the, the business benefits that people see um, with Kafka specifically, but then also with stream sets and Kafka, because there's a lot of um, inherent savings and, and advantages that you can gain out of this. And then we'll kind of round it out with a little bit of, uh, let's take it to the next level, focus on operations and, and making this stuff enterprise ready. Um, and, and then chat about a couple topics there uh, around data protection and things of that nature. And then of course, we'll open it up for QA. So before we jump in, I want to um, uh, level set, uh, pardon me, um, on, on a, we're going to start a poll here and, and kind of just get a sense of where folks are at with regards to their um, adoption of Kafka and their understanding of it. Um, so we get a lot of um, uh, different uh, maturity levels when we engage. Um, and the, as you can see here, we're just looking for a very simple uh, set of responses. A, you just, you're just not quite sure what it is, or you've heard of it, but you're not quite sure um, what all the nuances of it. Uh, maybe you're kind of just di dipping your toe in and just getting started. Uh, you've got a little bit of more experience maybe, and you've been using it for a little more than a year. And then, hey, we're the total experts in this stuff, and we're, we're looking to take it to the next level. So we, uh, we'll give this a couple minutes here just to kind of get a sense. And again, I just want to make sure that we level set on where everyone's at, um, get a feel for the audience and, and your, your level of adoption and, and maturity. So, Ryan, if we could just close that out and get the, the results here. And we'll uh, put those up on the screen. There we go. So, as we can see, we've got a pretty large swath of you that are really just at that early stage um, that uh, you're, you're kind of dipping your toe into it. So, I think we've got a good set of content for you today to kind of start to break down some of the problems, things that you need to be thinking about, and, um, and hopefully get you on a path to driving success uh, with, with Kafka more, uh, more, more rapidly. So I've closed out that window, Ryan, and we'll uh, jump into our materials. So um, really quickly, um, and I'm not going to go into this in, in enormous details, 
but, but just the level set, this, this comes directly from the Apache Kafka page. Um, and really, there's, a, a, there's three pillars um, in which the uh, Apache Kafka team describes the, the set of capabilities. The first is it's a, it's a publish and subscribe engine. So really like a messaging system, folks use Kafka for um, streaming data from applications and things of that nature, publishing them into a queue um, and push them downstream for consumption by a wide range of different types of applications. Um, Kafka is inherently different in that it can actually store and, and persist data for long periods of time. So on the right-hand side there, you can see that store. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a persisted queue that's distributed in nature, so you can create all sorts of different topics uh, and, and methods for, for storing data and keeping around for as, as many uh, or as long as you like. And then the, the middle piece is it kind of rounds out the equation that Kafka includes a, a stream processing engine called Kafka Streams that allows you to do um, real-time streaming analytics, if you will, um, on events as they occur in real time. So when you put all these things together, you can see that Kafka is, is very much a robust uh, platform for helping enable uh, stream processing workloads. So if you think about kind of the use cases for that, that group of you that are kind of new, um, and you're thinking about, hey, well, where is this broadly applicable for me or my company? Maybe you're just kind of um, understanding the technology itself and you haven't really thought about the, the, the other initiatives that are going on in your business. This is not an exhaustive list by any means, but it certainly is a fairly representative set of what's, what's common. Um, the first is this idea of a modern messaging bus. So we see a lot of organizations that are simply taking Kafka and using it to um, augment or replace uh, legacy uh, message queue systems. Um, the inherent benefit here is that um, Kafka can persist data and it helps scale far more effectively um, than, than those traditional systems uh, can do. So it helps organizations do a whole lot more than just a pub sub engine. Um, lots of organizations use it uh, in robust microservices architectures. So where we have got these big monolith applications that we want to break into small microservices that are more effectively communicating and working together. Kafka is a great backbone to help interlock all those different microservices to build and support that. Uh, type of application gives you a whole lot of uh, agility and, and, and benefits in terms of evolving applications over time and, and making sure their uptime uh, is, is uh, a whole lot better than what it was in the past. Um, we see a lot of things in the Internet of Things, which uh, should be of no surprise. So as organizations want to stream uh, event data from uh, sensor-enabled equipment of any type, um, Kafka is a great method for just picking up the high volume and, and variable types of data and pushing that downstream, as is cybersecurity when we want to get closer to real-time detection and understanding of, of uh, threat patterns and threat vectors. Um, Kafka is ideal for that particular type of scenario as well, so we can um, get a, a, a more up-to-the-moment uh, understanding of what's actually happening with regards to various threats that are going on in our business. Now, the, the use cases are, are definitely um, many, but there's, there's lots of challenges that start to emerge with, with uh, Kafka as, as we talk to customers who are adopting this. Um, and again, not an exhaustive list, but I think this is a pretty good representative set that, that folks will likely run into early on. Um, the first is this idea of, of custom coding. And, and you know, for many organizations, they have a lot of really uh, sharp and solid uh, engineers that can um, the write the code that's required to um, not only stand up your, your Kafka cluster, but connect it to all the different systems that um, you, um, you want to connect it to. The problem is, is that as your, um, your, your architecture becomes more complex, as the scale of it grows, um, and as the different types of systems that you want to connect um, just becomes increasingly diverse, um, your ability to keep up with that just becomes really, really hard. So the, the, the general idea that custom coding is, is involved with straight up Kafka um, is, is great in that it gives you a lot of flexibility and lets you engineers do a lot of different things, but eventually it's going to become a bit of a problem. So you need some mechanism that allows you to tap into both the custom coding nature of Kafka, but then also simplify and, and help uh, deliver acceleration benefits as much as possible. Um, the second thing is all around connectivity, and this is kind of an interesting one because there's a lot of um, different types of um, there's, a, there's a Kafka Connect framework that uh, is available for building connectors and, and connecting systems into a Kafka cluster. Um, but there's also a lot of different types of connectors that are floating around there in the world. But many of them are uh, A, open source, or B, scattered uh, in terms of where you're going to get support from a bunch of different vendors. So there's no one place that you can go 
to get broad connectivity for all the different types of systems that um, you want to uh, tap into. And so ultimately, when it comes to building a complex architecture and have a bunch of different systems, you need to start thinking about how are you going to uh, understand and get the support that you need for all the different types of systems that you are indeed connecting to. Um, so connectivity, while it seems actually fairly simple in concept, actually becomes potentially one of the bigger problems. Uh, the third thing kind of lower right here is, is this idea that data and its structure is constantly changing. And if you think about it in this world that we live in today, uh, just due to the, the, the course of normal business operations um, and the fact that we're dealing with um, highly variable data sets, both in the, the, the speed at which they're generated, but then also the fact that they're structured and unstructured, um, there's just this constant underlying theme of change. And so we need to be making it possible to uh, implement Kafka pipelines um, that uh, are, are decoupling uh, basically the, the source and the destinations and insulating from that change. So we run the risk of spending more time going back, uh, updating pipelines that we built than actually having those pipelines themselves move data around the organization. So if we can put in mechanisms that, that help us detect and automatically recover from, from change as it does indeed occur, obviously we can continue to, to continue to move data around the business a whole lot uh, more. And then the last thing, from a challenges standpoint, um, and this kind of gets into a little bit more of the advanced topics, uh, you could say, is the idea that multiple stream processing frameworks exist. Um, and if you kind of look at the space, um, there's, you know, I've got three on here that, that, that are uh, kind of more common ones. But there's, when it comes to uh, actually executing and working on data that uh, moves through a Kafka cluster, you've got options like Spark Streaming, you've got the Streams API and Kafka itself. Um, Flink is, uh, is uh, yet another option, and more times than not, uh, lots of different organizations aren't quite sure which one to use. Um, in many cases, um, you could argue that Spark Streaming, just from a first mover advantage, has got a bit of a land grab, but I've certainly talked to a number of organizations that have a strong concentration of Spark Streaming workloads, but that also are now considering using another stream processing framework for um, robustness purposes or, 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 or other reasons. And so the idea here is that there's probably not one um, that uh, is, is going to emerge and you need to be able to uh, set yourself up to be able to use one today, but then maybe mix and match down the road. Um, so um, it, it's hard to kind of bet on uh, which one of these is going to win in the end, you could say. Um, so I'd love to double click on the stream processing framework uh, idea a little bit more. So I'm going to do another poll here. Uh, Brian, if you could open that up and just ask the question, which, which stream processing framework are you actually using? Um, so you can see here I've picked a, a, a different set of uh, options, Spark Streaming, maybe you're doing Flink or some Storm or Kafka Streams, the Kafka Streams API directly in the Apache Kafka project, um, or perhaps it's something else um, and, and something that's not listed in here. But um, just to get a sense of uh, what, what folks are using, um, I suppose I should probably have an answer on here, which is I'm not using one period, but um, we'll get a sense of that here in a second when we get through this. So if uh, we can close up that poll, uh, Ryan, we'll get a sense of where folks are at. <clears throat> there we go. Thank you. So as so we can see, there's a pretty uh, good mix of, uh, of folks that are kind of concentrated um, for those actually using something. Um, between Kafka and Spark Streaming, um, which is uh, not all that surprising to see. I think you've got uh, things like uh, KSQL that have been added to the Kafka Streams uh, API that make it a whole lot easier to build uh, stream processing uh, workloads and jobs. Um, so it's uh, making that uh, component a little bit easier to adopt, um, even though it's later uh, addition to stream processing compared to Spark. But um, uh, the point here, as I alluded to on the previous slide, is that there is a lot of diversity and there's a lot of kind of mixing and matching or, or, or uncertainty. So um, as we'll talk about here with the StreamSets platform, it helps us uh, not have to worry about which one you pick um, as it will be able to give you a little bit of flexibility to mix and match and, and move around things uh, down the road. Okay, Ryan, if you close that out, thank you. <clears throat> so um, let's chat now about some transition into the StreamSets and how we're kind of helping some of these, these challenges and break some of them down. So we're going to chat about StreamSets Control Hub in particular, and this is our flagship um, uh, product for building Kafka and other pipelines for that matter um, in a very, very simplified uh, manner. So as you can see, we talk about collaborative development. We can automate deployment. Um, we can mix and match both batch and streaming workloads, and it helps 
um, organizations just get over the, the development complexity challenges, the scale challenges, and the operational uh, discipline that you need from a long-term standpoint to run Kafka and production down the road. So um, first and foremost, there's a collaborative pipeline design and we have a shared repository. So as you, if you imagine you build a pipeline with, with Kafka, you can publish that into a repository. Anybody working on the project can see that and can start to share and mix and match and we can create templates and things of that nature. So it makes it easy to get into self-service pipeline development, both from a data engineering standpoint, but then also we have organizations that actually use this to create self-service data as well. So we can publish data sets uh, as, as pipelines in this repository and, and folks can self-serve for their specific needs. Um, we, we dramatically help automate the pipeline deployment. So lots of times you're going to want to push this out to the edge or in the cloud or on-prem in some, some manner. There's lots of different types of orchestration tools that we can use to help make that happen. Um, but uh, invariably that becomes complicated and it involves a lot of uh, uh, hand-holding and whatnot. And so StreamSets automates a lot of that. We also deliver lineage capabilities um, into the equation. So um, we can uh, support governance initiatives. So if we can push metadata into leading tools such as Apache Atlas or Cloudera Navigator, then it makes it easier to um, capture what's actually happening with the data, who's ask, accessing it, what's the, the different dynamics of it. Um, and then we round out the solution with uh, architecture-wide visibility and control. And as you'll see, there's a whole bunch of operational metrics that we surface um, in the context of this conversation specific to the data that's moving through um, Kafka at any point in time. So a quick look. So StreamSets has a, um, uh, a core engine called the Data Collector. It's an open source download that's part of the Control Hub um, package. Um, so there's direct integration with Kafka. Uh, so as you can see, we've got objects on the palette here for Kafka's consumer. It's literally a case of just dragging and dropping um, these objects onto a palette, connecting them together, and we take all the code aspects out of the equation. So all you need to worry about is configuration parameters for the um, for the, the the jobs themselves. So focus on the data attributes that you are only interested in allows you to build adaptable flows. So we don't uh, require full schema specification. Um, as as data moves through uh, any sort of pipeline that that StreamSets is orchestrating. We are uh, constantly monitoring the metadata of the data, and so we can detect change within uh, things as they go, and that allows us to build and support these adaptable flows. So that idea of decoupling source and destination, as I alluded to before, is something that we can absolutely uh, support. We deliver uh, kind of uh, some level of data transformation, so we do not want to be a robust uh, data transformation engine in the con uh, in similar way that an old uh, traditional ETL tool would have been but we understand that there is some level of data transformation such as uh, data sanitization that you wanna do in stream. So we do indeed uh, deliver uh, capabilities so that you can do that directly in the tool. But we also focus heavily on extensibility and uh, make it so that you can leverage and plug in any custom code that you can write um, or that you've already written and you can plug those directly into the, um, into the pipeline. So you've got this framework that allows you to take a lot of the complexity out, but it doesn't mean that you have to throw away any work that you've already done and you can, uh, you can leverage any code that your data engineers or data scientists have used um, directly in these flows. Um, we have monitoring, as you can see, kind of on the lower side uh, to, to surface up what's actually happening within a pipeline specific to the data. So we can see how many records, what the throughput rate is. We've got uh, data accuracy metrics and errors and things of that nature. And then we focus on um, this idea of continuous operations. So being able to insulate from change, not only in the data, but also in the architectural components so that your, uh, your data flows can continue to operate at all times without, without interruption. So if we look at this a little more closely, um, so this first idea is adaptable flows. So again, this is not full schema uh, uh, specification. So you only focus on those attributes that you're interested in. Um, and can those through um, so that it makes it easier for us to detect those changes and only uh, propagate data downstream that we're actually interested in. As you can see on the right hand side in the black box, there's a wide range of uh, source systems and destination systems that we connect to. So, uh, you know, lots of, if not virtually every single type of system that you're going to want to be uh, pushing data into and out of Kafka with, we have uh, connectivity too. So you can use the Kafka consumer producer objects that we have 
and stitch those together with things like Hive or um, JDBC databases and things of that nature. Um, In-stream sanitization basically means, look, we can uh, detect any information and ensure that it, that, that it conforms and complies to specific data formats. Um, so again, we're constantly monitoring the data itself as it flows through. StreamSense itself does not actually store any data, it just moves it uh, through, through a pipeline to its ultimate landing point. But again, we are inspecting data as it moves so we can understand that if you want to apply certain attributes and sanitize or anything of that nature, we can actually make that happen as it goes. And again, as you can see on the right-hand side in the black box, there's a bunch of different data processors that we um, support and deliver so that you can do a whole bunch of different things with regards to um, forking data and merging data and things of that nature. Um, we also deliver monitoring um, for data as it flows. So it's kind of alluded to this before, but looking at record counts as data flows through a Kafka pipeline, um, what are the expectations? Are we actually seeing what we expected? Are there throughput problems? Um, and we can uh, flag errors uh, and things of that nature um, where inaccuracies start to um, start to uh, come into the to, to the flow. <clears throat> and then um, we also allow you to do uh, continuous operations. So regardless of the different types of workloads, there's a whole bunch of um, different types of um, uh, capabilities that make it possible for pipelines to run continuously. We can do data snapshots at any point in time, so we can do inspection of what's happening within a pipeline, uh, take corrective action without having to shut it down, and ultimately uh, limit the, uh, the, the amount of disruption that, that, that uh, comes along. So StreamSense Control Hub builds on the data collector tool, um, has in a cloud-based environment similar functionality to what I just described, so you can build these pipelines directly in the same interface um, and uh, do things additionally such as preview data as we go, so we can pre preview uh, at an individual stage of a pipeline. Um, so we'll get a sense of what's actually happening as we stitch these things together in a very complex architecture. The, um, sorry about this. Um, as I alluded to at the onset, there's a uh, pipeline repository, which is fantastic for larger teams of individuals to collaborate on Kafka pipeline development. So if we want to share best practices, or we want to start to enable uh, data self-service uh, using something like Kafka, we can publish named pipelines directly into this repository, and anybody with access to the tool can go in and actually start to leverage uh, those data sets directly and save a lot of time with regards to data requests and, and things of that nature. Um, plus, so if we want to start to standardize on how certain types of data is uh, sanitized, say, you can um, uh, start to do things like that. Version history is very important as we start to get uh, into scale. Um, so if we need to roll back for anything uh, for any reason or compare changes side by side, we can absolutely do that. And then as things are actually running, we just provide capabilities to just monitor the status of these things on an ongoing basis. So it makes it really, really easy to understand what's going on with your uh, cluster at any point in time. Um, again, in the version history side of things, uh, we can compare uh, pipelines side by side. So if you imagine that somebody goes and makes a change and we don't quite understand why the data set that's being delivered downstream suddenly um, is uh, delivering results that we're not expecting, um, we can do this side by side comparison so that we can actually see, hey, what, what processors maybe were changed on the right hand side there. Um, are there any error uh, constraints that have uh, changed as a result of that? And it just visually makes it very, very easy to do problem detection and ultimately shrinks a lot of the development cycles that teams use um, when it comes to actually doing pipeline development um, in, this, in this particular context. And then there's a bunch of other things like uh, status of available jobs. So we can see how things are running. For anybody using Kubernetes, we can provision jobs uh, via Kubernetes. Um, and we can look at individual uh, jobs, notifications, and alerts. So start to get into like an operational SLA type of a, a situation where um, we don't want to be having to constantly monitor and mi manually look for, for uh, issues and errors, but we can set up triggers and alerts so that when certain thresholds and conditions are met, we get some sort of notification and can be more proactive with regards to our response. And then the, where, the, where it really starts to get interesting is what if we just wanted to look at all this stuff at an architecture or topology-wide view? So StreamSets Control Hub allows us to take individual pipelines and start to actually view the, 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 the ins and outs of them uh, architecture-wide. So if we have data coming from 
a bunch of different sources into um, Kafka and then into a Hadoop system from there, perhaps, or search or a bunch of different other places, we can, uh, everything I've talked to before allows us to look at all the individual components and how they stitch together. But now we can kind of fan out a little bit and, and look at this at a higher level and see how all those pieces are, are interworking and, and intertwined. So lots of customization in here, but the main uh, advantage is all the metrics that we could see at an individual pipeline stand, uh, level now are architecture wide. So we get a much more detailed view of what's happening across the entire data flow versus just one component of it. And you can get a sense here of uh, some of the, the data points, so the total number of jobs that are executing across all the different um, uh, workloads, uh, the, the different data collectors that are running across different systems that are moving data, different types of pipelines that maybe are actually executing at any point in time. And then if we have multiple topologies as well, we can see that. And as you can see from the screen grab here, there's uh, there's data points such as record counts in this particular example of what's happening at each each uh, stage of the of the topology. So, in terms of problem determination, pinpointing where issues uh, lie, we can just dive straight into certain points of this stuff and and really start to understand what's happening with our data as it moves a whole lot more uh, freely and, and accessibly than we were able to before. So I'm going to. Uh, step back here and um, I'll stop talking about uh, the, the product and we'll actually let Kirit have a, a, a demo here and show you what's going on and he'll walk through uh, some of the capabilities that I've described and you'll actually get to see this stuff in action. So Kirit, over to you. Thank you, Clark. All right, so let me fire up my screen and uh, all right, so uh, before we get started, I, I did a really quick search on uh, writing a Kafka consumer. So I'm thinking, a lot of you who are doing development started probably a process like this, right? So you have to sit and write a bunch of code to code up the con consumer. You've got to, you know, obviously deal with uh, the whole issues around, uh, you know, are, are you writing it correctly? Uh, is it scaling properly? Uh, you know, how are you checking in, checking out? There's a huge amount of overhead to putting all of this stuff together, right? So we, as Clark mentioned, we make that whole process a lot, lot easier, right? So uh, let's let's start our journey here. So this is Streamsets Data Collector, uh, and this is basically a tool for designing pipelines and, and moving data. So here on my palette, uh, basically what I have is a large number of connectors that I can pick data from, right? So I can I can pick data from say. Uh, cloud sources, I can pick data from uh, NoSQL databases, from uh, you know streaming systems like Kafka, PubSub, et cetera, uh, all the way to just files and directory. So you know we happily work with structured, unstructured, uh, or semi-structured data. We, we are kind of agnostic to that whole thing. And as you'll notice, we, you know there's a huge amount of connectors. So if you need to uh, you know write from IoT uh, to, to Hadoop type systems, all of those are available to you. And likewise, there's a whole bunch of destinations as well. So you'll, you'll find a big list. I'm not gonna name all of them. I think the last count we were at over 100 plus connectors. And these are all sort of supported, uh, you know, from Streamset's perspective. And, uh, you know, this is the open source tool. So for, for this particular demo, you know, obviously we're gonna talk about Kafka in a little bit more detail. So what I did previously was I picked a Kafka consumer uh, in here and I just dragged and dropped it in. And uh, basically, all I need to do over here is effectively just c c configure all the details around where I'm reading from. So in this particular instance, this uh, instance of streams as data collector happens to be running on a Hadoop cluster, and I have you know a couple of different nodes of Kafka running. Uh, here's my Zookeeper details. Here's the topic that I'm reading from. Uh, and oh, by the way, this Kafka is uh, secure Kafka. Uh, so you know I've specified a bunch of uh, security-related settings over here. So uh, one thing I will mention is we, we support you know, obviously a whole bunch of different uh, versions of Kafka. So uh, you know as as you keep updating your environment, you can pick from any one of these, and it can be up and running very very quickly. Uh, the only other setting that we do over here is that of data format. And you know, like I mentioned, we are happily agnostic of the types of input formats. So here's an example of, of a whole bunch of that that we support. So you know, think uh, Avro, think binary if you if you're actually sending you know bit streams and such over, uh, obviously log files, uh, you know all of these things. For this particular demo, I'm, I, I know for for a fact that this consumer has SDC record. This is just an internal record format for us, um, and so I'm going to read that out. So the way that 
this would work is I drag and drop this configure it and I hit the preview button and it will show me it'll take a little snapshot of the of the da data and it'll actually show me the data right here. So at this point, what I could do is essentially start building the pipeline as I go along, right? So I'll take a very, very simple example. Let's say I have customer ID and uh, for really no good reason at all, just uh, because I'm doing a demo, I'm gonna uh, sort of uh, say hash that field. So I pick the field hasher, I tie this in and I say, okay, uh, if you find customer ID, uh, just hash it to an MD5. Right in a real world, obviously, you, you do a bunch of other things with it. Uh, so that, that's all I want to do. And just for now, I'm going to throw that into Thrash. This is basically dev null, great for testing and debugging pipelines, et cetera. Uh, and I hit the demo, uh, the preview button, and you'll see, oops, I had an error here. What did I do? Oh, OK, so I picked it in the wrong place. Uh, so let's say I'm doing customer ID, and I'm going to call it hashed. ID, I'll remove this, uh, do preview. And if you notice here, uh, the debugger shows you essentially that the fact that I got that customer ID and I hashed it over here. So as you can imagine, you know, there's a whole bunch of different processes that we have uh, support for. So that you can think things like, you know, out of the box, out of the box conversions, uh, lookups, to all, all different types of environments, like you know, you could look up from a database or or uh, HTTP or something of that sort, uh, or you could also do um, thing you know called Spark on the fly. So I could write a Spark job and run it uh, right here in the uh, in the pipeline. So to give you an example of how something like that would work, is we have a customer who does uh, credit card transactions, and so they want to classify whether or not a transaction is fraudulent. And they've written up their own ML Spark logic in there, and all they do is run this pipeline. So they're reading out of Kafka. Uh, you know, the transactions come in. Spark goes and classifies it and gives them a you know thumbs up or thumbs down, saying, "Yep, this record is fraudulent or not." And at that point, they get to make a decision. Okay, do I send it into say a Hadoop system uh, because you know, or, or into a directory that's that's basically good data, or do I send everything else into a completely different environment because this is a, you know, uh, this is where you say, say store bad data, for example. So there's a whole bunch of things you could do to create as much complicated pipelines that you need to get this up and running. Right, so, so that's the developer view of the world. As Clark mentioned, there's also a bunch of other areas that, that we can help with, right? So what happens when you now take that one individual de developer and scale it up into a whole team of developers, right? So at that point, you need to start thinking bigger in terms of, okay, I need repositories. I need to be able to do version controls on those things. I need to have like a whole uh, sort of a CI, CD or continuous integration, continuous delivery type, uh, you know, uh, problems that you need to be solving for. Uh, the other aspect of that is, uh, as you can imagine, in, in a real-world environment, there's not just a singular pipeline that you're dealing with, right? So a real application usually has hundreds or perhaps even thousands of different pipelines that are moving data from different parts of the system uh, to, to each other and, and doing you know, maybe transformations on the fly and all of that stuff. And uh, you need to be able to deal with that much, much better than looking at individual pipelines, looking at statistics for individual pipelines. And so this is where our topology concept comes in. And what we do over here is essentially kind of zoom out and give you a big picture view of the world. Right, so let's look at this example. This happens to be like a you know simple customer 360 environment. So I'm de reading data from say HTTP. This could be like you know uh, social media feeds, etc. Could be FTP data from third parties. Could be uh, just regular database uh, data that you need to bring in. Or let's say in this case, this is log files coming from clickstream systems. Right. Um, so. Out here, the architectural decision that was made was, oh, by the way, data coming in from these two sources, I want to have some sort of uh, sort of you know back pressure handling mechanism built in. I need to be able to put this into a message queue, and then oh, once I'm done here, I need to send it into Hadoop, but not just Hadoop. I need to essentially put that all that data into queryable uh, data that's accessible via Hive, for example. Whereas this other data perhaps is just directly going to Hadoop. So as you can imagine, customers can 
can use a wide variety of uh, sort of architectural models, models where Kafka is placed. Kafka in some situations could be sort of front and center uh, for, for the entire organization. It could be like sort of like the main glue that ties all of these systems together, or it could be just sort of one-offs where uh, you only need to do back pressure for one area, or you only need to have some sort of queuing, queuing me me mechanism for another area. Uh, so you, you decide where to put it in. From our perspective, it kind of doesn't matter because all you're dealing with is pipelines at the end of the day, right? So ultimately, underneath each of these blocks is in fact a pipeline. This one you know, reads from directory, does something from a GeoIP lookup perspective, and writes it into Kafka. And then likewise, on the other end, you know, we are reading out of Kafka. So I'm going to double click on this and get into it. So this pipeline reads from Kafka, does, does a bunch of simple transformations and such, and sends it into Hive. Now, here's another really, really important thing. And Clark alluded to this earlier about data changing, right? So consider the situation where you want data to be available in Hive, and you want your data scientists to, you know, be able to query that data irrespective of what new data came in right so think you, you know uh, i have sensors out on on the field you know this is iot data coming in and i had five sensor readings from every device coming in but someone in r d went and put in a, another version of the device which has sixth or seventh or eighth sensor now suddenly all those assumptions that i made earlier of the schema and all of that stuff they've gone out of the you know you just have to throw them out because if if you were doing all of this manually, you'd have to sort of code in the fact that, oh, I have sensor six, here's the data format, here's how I update Hive, and it becomes an incredibly manual uh, sort of onerous process. What we do really well is we, we do this uh, concept called data drift detection. So we are constantly monitoring the schemas of the data that are coming in, and automatically we can sort of adapt when the schema changes. So what this set of processes do over here is this uh, processor will read, uh, will know that the, the schema of the data that you're writing into Hive, and then when it sees a new schema element come in, it'll automatically do an update schema on Hive so that tomorrow when your data science folks come in, they'll see, oh, yet yet another table definition that you, they could start querying right away. So we've had use cases on you know customer premises where they had, uh, you know if I go back to sort of uh, the, the topology view of the world, uh, we've had a customer who've had like, 30 different uh, uh, subsidiary companies that they were getting data from. So this was data coming in from all their databases. So you can imagine thousands and thousands of different databases. And they were trying to bring that into a central data lake. And they had sort of Kafka in the middle, right? So each of these pipelines were writing into Kafka. And then another set of pipelines were reading out of Kafka, writing into Hive and, and uh, HDFS. And the problem that they had is, that the data kept changing on a daily basis, right? So some, some application on one of the subsidiary companies would suddenly change a uh, schema, and there was absolutely no way that the central data lake guys would even know that these changes occurred. So instead of going to that, doing that manually, this system would automatically take care of that, and they'd have consumption-ready data as soon as the system was up and running. So that gives you a sort of a brief of uh, how to use this uh, software, and I'll hand it over to Clark. Excellent. Thanks, Kirit. Very, uh, very insightful. And hopefully everybody got a, a sense of, um, of actually how this stuff works. Um, it's uh, always great to, to see it over and above me just talking about it. So um, as you can, as you can see from uh, the, the demo that Kirit went through, lots of great capabilities there. And as we've uh, alluded to and been talking about um, the benefits to accelerating Kafka pipeline are, are many. Um, so let's, let's chat about some of the success stories a little bit. So, um, you know, we've got uh, a few examples here. This one is um, Kafka pushing data into Elasticsearch. Um, and uh, the real need here was just moving towards um, low latency data movement for, for logs and, and uh, health, health uh, data um, in particular. Um, so StreamSets, as you can see, runs in, in the Spark streaming cluster, consuming messages at a 5K per second rate directly from, from, from Kafka and does a bunch of things with it and then pushes it down to, um, to, uh, to, uh, to Elasticsearch. And I think that the main benefit here that, uh, that this particular customer saw was um, just the idea of being able to freely scale up and down as needed. So just that, that great flexibility of, of ingesting through the platform um, and, and the different types of capabilities that we provide makes it uh, easier for them to 
meet the various different types of workloads that they have at any point in time in their uh, in their in their operation operating day. Um, the second scenario here is um, all around um, ingesting. I think this is uh, like what Tirit was just talking about in the demo, actually, where we've got 30 different uh, brands and data sources that are that are pushing data into this organization, and the the different types of um, data sources, uh, formats, uh, data is constantly changing. Um, and, uh, and there's just this idea that, that drift is happening of, of data all the time. So as they look to push this stuff downstream, um, prior to stream sets, spent an enormous amount of time um, running into uh, just pipeline rework every time something did indeed change. Along come stream sets using the drift detection capabilities that Kira had alluded to. The fact that they have these three different types of data sets doesn't really impact them anymore, and they can continue to move the data downstream freely and continue to operate. And, no longer have IT being the bottleneck with regards to data delivery to the various stakeholders that need it across the business. And then um, some of the one of the use cases, pardon me, that I mentioned at the onset was was cybersecurity, where we see a lot of Kafka coming together with stream sets to um, to do more uh, uh, insightful interrogation of, of threat patterns and things of that nature. So in this particular scenario, uh, the customer needed to augment their cyber solution to get more real-time um, detection of, of anomalies um, so they could be more proactive with regards to understanding if there was a new threat, if there were um, uh, particular vulnerabilities, and if something was to occur, how could they react to it very, very quickly and understand what happened. So. And you can see ingesting data from a number of different uh, uh, systems uh, like Cisco, Windows, Syslog, um, pushing that through uh, stream sets into Kafka, doing some uh, stream processing with Spark, um, and then standardizing in a data model with, uh, with our integration with Apache Spot and the Cloudera platform, but then also enabling search as well so the, the forensics teams can do more rapid discovery of, uh, of potential uh, threat patterns or analysis when something does indeed occur. So massive benefits with regards to the simplicity of the architecture, but then also the delivery of data that allows them to better protect and secure their organization than they could before. So um, getting down to the last couple of slides here, so let's chat a little bit about some of the benefits. So, um, you know, StreamSense, when we put it in front of Kafka, as I've kind of alluded to a couple of times, is, is, is very helpful with regards to development productivity and just making it easier for data to get through uh, the, the organization, but then stand up pipelines from scratch um, dramatically uh, faster and more efficiently than we could before. So on the left-hand side, um, a leading healthcare company, um, all three of these we cannot name, unfortunately, but uh, nevertheless, they're, they're uh, very interesting stories. Um, the before and after of pipeline development led to $1.4 million in savings of development costs. Um, so they were spending just so much time learning new different uh, programming paradigms, um, constantly changing uh, those, uh, the custom code that they wrote as the data sets themselves uh, changed. Along come stream sets. We build the, uh, the pipelines very simply as Kira showed in the demo. But then also, because we can help with, uh, with drift detection, it means that they spend a whole lot less time on just constantly iterating and updating them, and, and that's where the savings comes from there. We have a, a leading market intelligence agency that uh, is leading, uh, working on a, a Kafka uh, project. They had six developers on their, their Kafka development team. Um, post stream sets coming in, the, the simplification of building Kafka pipelines, that team was able to go down to six, or pardon me, down to two. And that freed four people up to work on higher value uh, projects that the organization just wasn't able to get to before. So it's basically a do more with the same type of scenario when you throw stream sets into the mix. It gives you just that huge productivity gain and allows your teams just to be that much more uh, efficient. Um, and then with regards to the stakeholders and those folks that are ultimately wanting to get their hands on the data, um, be it data scientists, uh, if they're not already working in our tool, um, or uh, analysts and, and folks of that nature, um, there's a, a financial services firm that literally went from 60 days down to two hours with regards to how rapidly they could deliver specific data sets um, by using the, the stream sets platform to, uh, to start to uh, build and, and push data downstream. And that was a combination of, of just rapid iteration, uh, the, the drift detection and the change insulation, but then the, the ability to, to, to build the pipelines very fast when data requests came in. So, um, as you can see, there's a, there's a lot of advantages that, that come into the mix here when, uh, when you marry stream sets with Kafka uh, together. 
So a couple of things just to, to round this out. I won't belabor these very, um, very lengthy because I do want to get to the Q&A. But uh, oftentimes folks want to run pipelines at the edge. So we do have a component called StreamSets Data Collector Edge that uh, allows you to build those pipelines that Kira showed us and actually edge the, uh, run those, pardon me, on edge uh, the devices. So anything that is somewhat nomadic, perhaps, it's got low footprint requirements, uh, needs to have minimal uh, uh, memory consumption uh, on it. Um, we, can, uh, we can take those pipelines and run them out there. So when we've got uh, different types of scenarios um, and use cases in, um, uh, in, say, oil and gas and energy, where you have a lot of remote systems out in the field, uh, these edge pipelines can make it really easy to rapidly ingest data from a bunch of different sources and not have to send people out to read uh, those types of things. So it's a nice extension to the platform. Um, and most recently, we added new capabilities around protecting sensitive data while it's in motion. So there's a lot of um, kind of data, uh, mass, uh, data protection capabilities for data at rest, but we saw an opportunity um, given the capabilities of our platform and the fact that we constantly understand what's going on with an individual pipeline and what, what the nuances of the data are to actually be able to provide additional capabilities for protecting sensitive information. So if we can spot PII data, say, it allows us to do different types of capabilities. And so we added a component called StreamSets Data Protector that does just that. And there's three pillars of capabilities that this product brings. Um, the first is uh, kind of lower left, the, the discovery of it. So we, when we define what the different types of data that we want to look for, we can do that across all the incoming streams of data, uh, be it in Kafka or anything else, and, and point those things out. Once we identify and find the things that we actually want to uh, protect in some capacity, we, we provide a bunch of capabilities for obfuscation. Um, there's, there's reversible and irreversible uh, uh, techniques that we deliver uh, capability-wise. So it gives you a lot of flexibility with regards to how you protect uh, different data sets and uh, different policies that you can apply to uh, different parts of the organization and teams, uh, given that different people have different data access and, and privacy requirements for, for data sets generally. And then to round it out is some level of governance. So if we can report on that as well, um, that'll uh, obviously allow us to be able to prove to regulators and, and the like that we're actually taking the, the steps needed to ensure that we're not exposing sensitive data to the wrong parts of the business or any individuals. And so this really rounds out our platform and gives you a lot of confidence with regard to data protection, particularly in this context of, of Apache Kafka. So last slide here, I think, um, is kind of from an architecture standpoint, just to give you a sense of, of what we're looking at. I think you've probably got this with, uh, with Kira's demo, but you know, we can adjust from any uh, type of source on the far left push that into the, into the middle, um, do a whole bunch of different uh, data manipulation techniques on it um, and, uh, and do interactions there. And then when we want to do different types of analytics as well, we integrate with a broad portfolio of different types of tools. So if you need to catalog things, if you need to actually do um, uh, data prep, and then all the way down to uh, streaming uh, visualization and things of that nature, there's a whole host of different types of uh, tools and, and, and whatnot that we work with. So you can build a really robust uh, architecture in a simplified manner, uh, be it Kafka or anything else, uh, using the StreamSets platform. Um, so there's a, just a representative set of what we've got. So we showed you Control Hub in the middle. Data Collector is that uh, open source download. So if you were so inclined, you could go to our website and download Data Collector and start using this right away um, to build your, your pipelines. Um, so a simple download straight from our, our website. Um, that is uh, not a cloud tool as the others are. Data flow performance managers, the topology level metrics, largely that that stream sets alluded to, and then you can see the edge and the data protector components that uh, I mentioned before. Okay, so with that, um, we've got a few minutes left to um, to handle some questions here. So I'm going to uh, kind of dig in really quickly um, and uh, kind of triage some of these things as many of them we can. Um, there's there's a question around. Um, uh, Apache, uh, NiFi, and Kafka with regards to stream sets and Kafka. So, um, uh, without getting into all the the, the, the details of, of um, how the products compare, the comparison to make there is NiFi versus stream sets versus um, Kafka stream sets. Uh, so, so we work with Kafka, not uh, as a replacement too. Um, that said, NiFi is a data movement um, kind of UI uh, in spirit uh, along the lines of what we just showed you. Um, a lot of our advantages and why customers choose us over NiFi are just the, the, the simplification of the UI. 
um, and uh, the ability to to build the pipelines in a very very easy manner as we saw. Um, there's other things that uh, that we uh, enable, like uh, there's some data loss concerns, and I find things of that nature that uh, that are not problems in our platform, given that we are an in-memory versus a disk-based solution. So, um, happy to take that question offline and get into it in a whole lot more detail. Um, Karen, I'm going to throw this one to you with regards to um, some of the uh sla types of capabilities um breakpoints and, and whatnot can can you elaborate on how the you know the, the flags and triggers and things like that work in in the product in particular there's some stuff around how that works with custom code yeah so uh, i mean just just broadly speaking in terms of slas uh you know essentially the, the way to think about it is we can we can essentially uh let you uh, set up your own SLAs in terms of, okay, I need so much data to be delivered or I'm expecting such and such throughput to get through. And if those thresholds, you know, if it goes above or beyond those thresholds, we can essentially notify, allow you to take action based on that, right? So the end result is about making sure your data gets there on time uh, at the right speed uh, and things of that sort. Uh, the other angle we're also looking at is, you know, imagine a situation where you're, you know, reading out of a Kafka stream and and you have, uh, you know, let's say, five megabits per second. That's that's your sort of steady state. And then suddenly that number spikes up to 10, 20, 30. This could happen, you know, perhaps like uh, events like Black Friday or some seasonal uh, events and such like that. And so you could imagine. Uh, you know, one of the next things that we're looking at is how can we take that and convert it into let me spin up a new SDC just to handle that load for you, right? So those are the types of things that we can help with. Great, thank you. Um, can you also chat a little bit about our CDC support? So there's a couple, or at least one question here about that and how um, how we do CDC. Sure thing. So, so actually, let me step back and just talk broadly about relational systems. Uh, CDC being just one component of it. So, we we can read from uh, a wide, wide variety of relational systems. So, we have JDBC connectors that can read, you know, either from single tables or multiple tables. Uh, it can automatically sort of partition the data and uh, move, you know, move it accordingly. Uh, think of it as as scoop. Uh, so, in fact, we we actually have a scoop uh, importer tool which is able to sort of read a scoop a scoop you know, script and convert it into a equivalent stream sets pipeline. So all those features over there are available. So, so that's step one in terms of just reading from JDBC. Then of course you need to keep that going in real time and that's where CDC comes in. So we have connectors for Oracle, for um, uh, uh, MySQL, uh, for uh, MapRDB, uh, for example, uh, even for NoSQL databases like uh, you know MongoDB, and then of course SQL Server as well. So we are able to read data from any of these sources, and you know hence and write it out into uh, all these destinations as well. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I'll take this one. Do we have uh, Control Hub packaging for on-premises? The answer there is yes. Um, so it is possible to uh, get the Control Hub capabilities for on-premises deployments. I'm um, happy to chat with you about how that works. Um, Kirit, again for you, um, can you chat a little bit about fault tolerance uh, and, and how we're uh, you know, building or what our capabilities are there to, to deliver fault tolerance? Sure thing. Uh, so again, yeah, I'll, I'll step back because we actually handle it you know, very comprehensively. So uh, step one is uh, you know, your, your actual data collectors, the, the stuff that moves the data. Uh, is is potentially a point of failure when, when you have just a single one running. So we have mechanisms where we can, uh, using the Kubernetes things that Clark had mentioned earlier, we could bring up multiple instances of data collectors and essentially make sure that they are up and running. So if one fails for some other re for some reason, uh, you know, it'll fail over to uh, bringing up another instance of the data collector. So th that just happens at the execution layer. But then what we can help with also is at the pipeline layer. So we will we can configure pipelines for HA and when one stops for whatever reason, we can basically fail over to another pipeline and keep running the load accordingly. Now, the, 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 these, these types of systems are great for sort of standalone environments or you're bringing up your own uh, systems. But let's say you are already on the Hadoop environment and you're running it in the Hadoop cluster. What we could actually do is read off of, say, uh, uh, you know uh, Kafka. If you have multiple partitions of Kafka, we could essentially deploy as like a spot streaming application on multiple nodes within Hadoop, and each node reads all of them. So if one dies, it'll automatically fail over and such like that. Uh, so there's there's basically a, a wide variety of 
HA options that that's built in the VM entire platform. Excellent. Um, let's see, we're coming up on time. I'm going to take one more um, uh, question about SaaS apps and, and Salesforce in particular. Can you talk about our uh, integration with Salesforce? Yeah, so so we actually both read and write uh, to Salesforce just fine. You know, you can uh, just download our open source software and you'll see connectors for that. Um, you know, we, we've also been looking at, uh, in fact, doing a certain amount of CDC from Salesforce as well. Uh, so th there's a, definitely a lot of capabilities around uh, Salesforce. We have a bunch of customers who are uh, effectively doing, you know, the customer 360 type of stuff where they happen to be reading out of uh, Salesforce and then they're, you know, going back and doing analysis on some other platform. Okay, great. Um, there's a few questions here in terms of, you know, if we just want to get started. Um, so uh, StreamSets Data Collector, as I alluded to in some of the, one of the slides, is an open source uh, product. So if you're so inclined, you can go and download that directly from our website um, and, and get started right away. We are also in the process of building a, a, a trial for a Control Hub too. So um, please reach out to us um, if you're interested in that, and we can get you onto that platform to kind of check out some of these capabilities too. Um, so we've got about two minutes left. There's a bunch of other questions, Ryan. I'm going to take these offline, um, and, and we'll follow up with folks afterwards. Um, but I, I wanted to take the last couple of minutes just to thank everybody for joining us. Um, I know that uh, everyone's busy these days, and, and time is, is a, a premium, so we do appreciate that you spend the time to uh, come and listen to our, our conversation today. We hope that this was an informative session, helps you understand how uh, you can get going with, with Kafka, um, but, but do so in a way that uh, helps drive success a whole lot faster and then sets you up for scale and success down the road. Um, so hopefully you uh, saw some great capabilities in our platform, and um, we will uh, look forward to engage with you all down, down the road as uh, any other questions come up. So with that, uh, thanks very much for joining us today, Kira. Thanks very much uh, for, uh, for the, the great demo, and I wish everybody a, a great and fantastic rest of your day. Thank you all. Great. Uh, well, thanks very much, Clark and Kirit, for a wonderful presentation today. Uh, I'd also like to thank today's sponsor, StreamSets, for providing the DZone audience with a great webinar. And lastly, thank you to everyone who joined us today. We hope you learned something new that will help you in your developer career. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time.